Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon or good morning um, or good evening, depending on wherever you are. Um, thank you so much to you all for joining us today, um, especially given that we are at the end of a very packed week of HMPW and Global Logistics Cluster events. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, uh, my name is Mandy George. I'm the team leader for the Joint Initiative for Sustainable Humanitarian Packaging Waste Management. Um, and just before we officially open this session, uh, just a couple of small housekeeping things. Um, if I could ask uh, participants to please keep muted um, and uh, pop any questions into the chat box. Um, we will have a Q&A session in the second half of the hour that we're here together um, today. So we will address them then, if not before, uh, via the chat. Um, we've also put together a Google form uh, for those who would like to know more um, about this initiative or to get involved in it. Um, we will drop that into the chat box now. So please um, fill it in and let us know what areas of packaging waste management um, your interest lies in. And if you'd like to know more, uh, we will be back in touch with you after that. Um, and now to open up this session, um, I'll hand over to Greg Rulifson who is a USAID Sustainability Advisor in um, BHA's Supply Chain Management Division. Uh, over to you, Greg. Thank you, Mandy. And can you hear me okay? Very well, Good. thank you. Excellent. Um, yeah, so thanks everybody for being here. Yeah, like Mandy said, at the uh, end of a long uh, two weeks now. Um, so really appreciate um, all, all of you participating. And we do uh, really hope that you'll um, join us in participating here. So dropping questions in the chat, participating in the polls and, and everything else. Um, so just to introduce this joint initiative, um, we're a partnership of humanitarian actors working together to make packaging and humanitarian assistance more environmentally and socially responsible. Um, so I know it's a long name. Uh, we're going to stick with it for now. The Sustainable Humanitarian Assistance Packaging Waste um, Management. So um, all of us, this really is joint initiative, this approach of getting everybody together because these environmental challenges really are too big um, for any one organization to solve on their own. Um, and so throughout this week, we had, you know, we had the, um, the briefing session on Monday, which was just a half hour. Hey, here's, here's what's going on um, with some, some high level remarks. Um, yesterday, we actually co-hosted a donor session with ECHO and SDC, and we had 13 different uh, nations represented as well as um, in, in close to 50 participants. Um, in that session, trying to align a little bit better and have some more joint efforts um, in, the, in the donor space as well. So just for this particular initiative, um, as we are continuing to grow, uh, here are um, the 15 other um, partner organizations um, that are represented and that are participating. Mandy's going to get into some of the details of the activities that they're leading um, and, uh, and, and that we're collaborating on. So you can see many of them there from uh, the NGOs, uh, Save the Children, Catholic Relief Services, our, our UN and ICRC um, partners, um, the donors themselves, uh, FCDO, uh, uh, ECHO, and USAID, and then the Lincoln Laboratory um, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who's doing some work for us as well. So we're continuing to try to grow our, um, our, our efforts um, and hopefully getting some more involvement from uh, the rest of the participants here today as well. And so with that, we have a little bit of an exercise for all of you, uh, some, something to, uh, you know, get, it, get our, our brains working a little bit at the, at the end of a long Friday or earlier on a Friday for me. So I'll pass it over to Samira actually to uh, do a little did you know quiz. Good morning, everyone. So um, as Greg said, to kick us off and get some momentum going, we came up with some fun or maybe not so fun facts uh, related to packaging waste um, related to humanitarian food assistance. And so our first fact is that in fiscal year 2020, um, 18,000, 18,931,200 000, units of polypropylene bags went out with USAID humanitarian food assistance. And so um, to make this activity a little bit engaging, I'm going to launch a poll that should come up um, on your screen. So let me know if you can't see the polls. But um, given the amount of polypropylene bags that went out, how much of the area of Geneva do you think that that would cover? Um, so the options that should be in front of you are 25%, 40%, 65%, and 70%. Um, so go ahead and give the poll a vote. 
and uh, let's see what you come up with. And if you can't see the poll, uh, feel free to leave your answers in the chat as well. That would be fine, however many um, percentage points you think it would cover. Ah, okay. I'm getting some messages in that it looks like you might have to fill in all the answers before you can submit the poll. So go ahead and have a look at the other questions as well. Um, our next fun fact has to do with ready to use food packaging. And so um, in fiscal year 2020, there were 805,110 pounds of ready to use food packaging waste um, that went out with Title II food assistance. Um, and how much of that do you think would be the equivalent weight of the Antarctic blue whale, which is the world's largest animal. And then finally, your third question is um, in fiscal year 2020, the amount of cardboard cartons sent out with USAID humanitarian food assistance was over 10 million pounds. And which of the three options in front of you do you think is the closest equivalent? And this again is just USAID, US sourced food assistance. So really, if we thought, if we thought about um, the full extent of, of packaging waste across the entire humanitarian supply chain, um, we might be able to cover a lot more of Geneva or um, you know, weigh a lot more Antarctic whales. So go ahead and lock in your answers. Give it a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. So um, for some context, the amount of polypropylene bags that went out in fiscal year 2020 would actually cover almost 70% of Geneva. Um, so that is a huge amount of polypropylene bags. Continuing on, uh, we would have the equivalent weight of, of about two Antarctic blue whales in ready to use food packaging waste. And the amount of cardboard cartons that went out in fiscal year 2020 would be the approximate weight of 2.4 fully loaded space shuttles, um, each space shuttle coming in at about 4.4 million pounds. And so um, the other options for the cardboard cartons weren't too far off. Uh, it would have weighed about five football fields or 2,600 standard cars. And so um, we hope that this activity was able to put into perspective just the huge amount of packaging waste that exists across the supply chain. Again, I want to reiterate that this is just USAID Title II food assistance packaging waste. Um, so if you start to think about really the full scale of, of the issue, um, it is a quite large one. And so thank you for engaging in this activity. Um, we will move on and I will pass it over to Amanda, Mandy. Thank you so much, Samira. And um, wow, that is that is a lot of packaging waste. Um, and as you mentioned, just uh, part of the um, the overall picture. Um, so I am I'm just going to jump into a little bit more about the Joint Initiative, um, the Joint Initiative for Sustainable Humanitarian Pact Management, which doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well as the Joint Initiative. So I may just refer to it as that from this point onwards. Um, Greg has already mentioned some of these points. In his introduction, but just to show, our aim is really to minimize the environmental impact of packaging um, and turn it into opportunities for those um, we assist. Obviously, the scale of the problem is is massive, and of course, this is just humanitarian packaging. We're dealing with um, the global waste management problem being um, quite a bit larger, and this is only part of it. Um, so, our approach um, has many facets to it. So first and foremost, um, coordination. So all of our partners, um, of which you've seen some of the logos on the previous slide, and um, we have 16 at the moment, 
Um, all of them have many sustainable packaging initiatives ongoing. Um, and so one of our main aims is to improve coordination of these really excellent efforts across the sector um, and in turn increase our impact uh, by finding collective solutions to the packaging and waste management challenges that we are all facing. Um, to do this, we take a circular economy approach. So we're looking across each step of the supply chain. Um, we are also a multi-donor initiative, though spearheaded by USAID um, in the first instance. Um, we have various donor partners involved as well um, and are exploring uh, funding streams to look at, um, at other options over the duration of the initiative um, for the next four years or so. Um, we are looking also at both bottom-up and top-down approaches. So actors at the operational level of course need to implement solutions while others in decision-making roles need to provide um, the much needed tools and resources um, to be able to do this. Um, we have a large um, awareness raising component as well in this initiative. Um, so we want to make um, this the solutions more visible and encourage engagement um, amongst all of our partners and across the sector. Um, we are also focused on being good stewards for the environment, of course, which includes taking responsibility for packaging um, and also shifting the narrative um, to opportunities. So reframing a little bit the concept of waste um, into a circular economy approach. So looking also at its opportunities, not only minimizing impact and mitigating. Um, so just to emphasize again, we really are chartering our way forward collaboratively um, with decisions made by our partners and activities led by our partners, uh, which is really, I think, the strength of this kind of initiative. Um, next slide, please. So uh, some of our key steps to date, just to um, recap on where we are and how we got here. So 2019, um, the initiative was co-conceived uh, between USAID and uh, WFP and the logistics cluster. Um, and we then um, went into a phase of scoping and a scoping study was published in July. I'm sure we can pop the link to that in the chat uh, for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, this then led to a uh, collective uh, joint planning process, collaborative road mapping process uh, towards the end of last year. Um, and building out from this planning process, we um, put together our four year log frame and activity plan, um, which is basically yeah, coming off the back of the scoping study, our partners priorities and this joint planning exercise. Um, this plan was approved in February and um, uh, the first uh, lot of funding for the initiative from, from USAID um, came through um, around now. And so we are at USAID's role, uh, which Greg will speak a little bit more to in a moment, but being uh, largely on the coordination, communications, um, a support services front, uh, also leading on some of the technical activities as well. Um, and then um, we have been kicking off activities as well this month um, with the approach that uh, our different partner organizations lead specific activities and then have multiple um, organizations uh, participating in each activity. Um, so, I'm going to um, run you through uh, some of these activities um, in a bit more detail, um, not in too much detail because there's a lot of them, but if there are any that resonate with you, uh, please do let us know um, if you'd like to get involved and participate. Uh, just quickly, this is our, um, this is our log frame or sort of revo results framework. Um, I won't go into this in too much detail, but I just wanted to show you um, this image to give you a sense of our overall approach um, and our work plan, um, which is quite ambitious um, and spans both the upstream and downstream uh, parts of the supply chain um, and work with our with our first outcome being more focused on coordination, um, advocacy, etc. And the second one much more on the um, operational side of things. If I could have the next slide, please, Samira. Thank you. So I will talk you through uh, our approach with some examples of activities. Um, so firstly, on the policy and advocacy side. So we will be looking at first um, analyzing the humanitarian assistance supply chain policy landscape, and then seeing what opportunities there are for standardizing it. Um, obviously, working with donors um, will also be a critical part of this work. Um, 
We will also be looking at some very practical guidance on policy related issues. Uh, for example, um, I know that a lot of us are facing issues with um, international and national um, plastic bans. Um, so looking at policies governing uh, plastic use um, and putting these together in a very practical um, guidance note for our partners to use, um, including national plastic bans, uh, relevant Basel Convention regulations on transboundary movements, etc. Um, and this activity will be led uh, primarily by the Unit Bolitia Joint Environment Unit uh, with um, many partners participating. Uh, on the packaging data and evidence uh, side of things. So we recognize that we can't improve what we don't fully understand. So of course, uh, this work stream is really critical to increase our evidence base of current humanitarian packaging, um, both scale of this packaging and also environmental impact. Um, to inform the full life cycle. So we will start with a sector-wide environmental impact and scale analysis of the main humanitarian packaging items and materials, uh, basically a sector-wide baseline. Um, we will also be looking at uh, life cycle assessments of some of the highest volume uh, packaging items. And we're going to hear a little bit more from WFP later on today about these really critical activities. Uh, next, um, on the procurement side of things, um, we aim to improve, standardize, and harmonize global procurement specifications um, through providing su suppliers and humanitarian procurement staff with the guidance and tools to be able to do this. So, for example, through producing tools like a packaging sustainability criteria list for tender contracts, um, a guidance note on best packaging practices uh, for environmentally sustainable procurement, um, which should be targeted at more at procurement officers, um, as well as trying to improve coordination on this topic through setting up an information sharing and coordination mechanism uh, for procurement specifically. Um, and also importantly, working on improving packaging specifications um, and seeing how we can standardize these specifications. Um, many partners uh, have or are introducing specification improvements that can be shared. Um, we'll have an example of this from ICRC a little bit later on today. Um, and then this will be followed by a discussion on standardizing specifications and how to take this forward. Um, of course, building on the data and evidence from the baselining and LCA activities I mentioned earlier um, that would feed uh, into this work. Uh, next on the design production and distribution front, we are looking to see how can we design, produce, and distribute packaging in a way that minimizes plastic and reduces the overall environmental impact of the packaging. So for this, we aim to both make information on the sustainable packaging technologies and materials that are available, um, available through a catalog or, or a database um, of potential options for field use, and then as well via R&D to reevaluate the design of some of the most common packaging products uh, to increase sustainability. And then last but certainly not least, um, looking at end of life waste management. So this output really is about strengthening locally tailored sustainable end of life waste management solutions um, in humanitarian operations through better access to tools and data. Um, so our concept here is also really looking at packaging as more than just waste, uh, presenting opportunities um, for uh, recipients of assistance. Um, some examples of activities under this um, work stream um, will include a mapping of available waste management infrastructure in some of our key operating countries, as well as understanding uh, market-based opportunities for secondary use of packaging, um, reuse, recycling, etc. Um, we also are looking at um, a tool to assess packaging waste management in the field, which is planned to be built into the NEAT Plus, the Nexus Environmental Assessment Tool, um, as well uh, later on this year. Um, and we will hear a little bit more about some of these end of life waste management activities from CRS and WFP um, in a moment. Um, so before we hear from some of our other partners on activities that they are either leading or contributing to, I would like to hand it back to Greg um, to tell us a little bit more about USAID's commitments and role um, in this initiative. 
Great, thanks, Mandy. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to give a little bit of insight into, and you know, we'll have our partners presenting on um, what they're doing and you know, the, the internal workings a bit and their commitments. So I just wanted to share some of what we're doing in USAID. So as Mandy mentioned, I'm the sustainability advisor. So I'm leading the effort internally to get our um, supply chain colleagues and office level and then bureau level colleagues and connect these across um, USAID uh, at the agency level as well. So just showing a, just briefly a little bit of who all are involved in this right now. So we have um, uh, in the supply chain management division, there are five of us um, going to be six with another fellow coming on, maybe seven um, in, uh, later in the fall. Uh, we have some of our expertise in the technical program quality office and um, our bureau environmental officer, Erica Claseri, um, as well, really leading um, and, and, and getting us integrated across the bureau. Uh, we also have the ECOS uh, environmental compliance um, support staff. So Carmen Saab, Mandy George, Chris Pettit, others who've been working um, tirelessly on this effort and certainly Mandy leading us overall. Um, so having support generally and then some of that expertise. Uh, and then we have the Lincoln Laboratories, which we'll present more uh, later on um, in, in other sessions um, and, and other opportunities. But we have five researchers, maybe it's closer to six now, working on prototyping and piloting um, um, clean energy um, packaging waste management um, technology. And then uh, finally on this, we also have a private sector landscape assessment that um, is, has started. So that's looking at what, just as Mandy was talking about, what are those opportunities to connect some of the packaging waste once we collect it, process it a little bit, where can it go for some kind of um, productive reuse or getting back into a local economy? Um, yeah, and then I'll just give you a little more insight on the next slide. So this is where I just wanted to give a little mind map of a bit of a, um, not exactly an org chart, but how we are connected across the board, across the agency. Um, so TPQ, Technical Program Quality Office, there's a nutrition team, markets team, um, food technology team, um, field and response operations office, Sparrow, that's where I sit with my other supply chain management colleagues, our geographic offices, humanitarian budgets and management, um, office, uh, that's where our Bureau Environmental Officer, Erica Claseri sits and is really been pushing this forward, making sure that we can get those the grant funding. Um, and then our policy work as well. So we have liaisons and um, relationship managers for WFP, for our other global um, public international organizations like ICRC and IOM, um, others for our NGO colleagues. So making sure that they're all tied in and speaking uh, the same language, um, you know, playing from the same page. And then uh, just a couple of notes from our uh, other agency bureaus, so Global Health and the Democracy Development and Innovation, that there's an ocean plastics team, that there's an innovation division, I think, or center. And we're connecting our efforts across with them as well as we try to go from our humanitarian to the development um, and turning these into livelihoods activities in addition to uh, just getting the packaging waste out of these environments. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of insight um, how we're doing it from our our perspective from the donor uh, end um, and our other donors, uh, ECHO and FCD are, are doing it in, in their own ways as well. Um, but yes, yeah, so with that, I'll pass it back over to Mandy to get us going on uh, the partner presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, so we are very pleased to have some of our partners presenting today on their engagement with the joint initiative, as well as some examples of their approaches to sustainable packaging waste management. Um, and also some of the activities that they are either leading in or leading or participating in uh, for the initiative. So if I could invite first up um, from ICRC, um, Carmen, who is ICRC Sustainable Supply Chain Alliance Project Manager and Stefan, ICRC's Quality Manager, who are gonna speak a little bit about the activity around packaging specification improvements and some examples from, from the ICRC side. Hopefully, Carmen and, and Stefan, you are able to unmute yourselves. You should be able to, but let us know. Hello, I hope you can hear me now. Yes, perfectly. Thank okay. You. So, hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mande, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Carmen Garcia Duro. I'm, I am the Sustainable Supply Chain Alliance Project Manager in the International Committee of Red Cross. Um, the challenge that the humanitarian world faces in order to make operations and our supply chains more sustainable is huge, as all of you, um, as all of you know. 
We need to make sure that we work together. This is the only way we can make it happen. I'm convinced that this joint initiative will help us learning from each other and improving packaging in a very pragmatic way. We need to create synergies and to make sure that our suppliers understand that sustainability is here to stay and that they need to get ready. The only way to do this is working together as a group and not alone. Um, as um, Mandy already mentioned, ICRC is participating in different initiatives. One of them is related to specification improvements for packaging of main relief items. That's, that's why I would like to uh, present or introduce uh, Stéphane Outmarchand, who is our head, of, head of quality team in ICRC and who has a huge experience on working with the suppliers to make our purchases more sustainable and has already reduced a lot the packaging of, on our main uh, items. So please, <clears throat> Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carmen. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's speak a bit about um, how to, to decrease the amount of plastic we are using uh, every day when we distribute goods. Um, so to, to, to work on it, we decided to, to apply an eco-design approach. We can see in a slide too. Yes, eco-design approach. In fact, we try to, to, to work mainly with manufacturers and to avoid in traders because with manufacturers, we can work on how we can decrease impact. For instance, working in polishing, how to decrease the polishing with the kitchen set, for instance, and also working on packaging. Uh, 10 years ago, we decided to see how we can um, stop using plastic bag uh, in our kitchen set and to try to see if we can replace the plastic bag by, by, by um, cardboard or packing instead. Next slide. So you will see that uh, when we, um, last year, in fact, we decided to, to, to launch a new tender for a kitchen set. And you see on the picture that only um, considering 15 kitchen set, you see the amount of plastics that uh, represent this uh, only 15 kitchen set. So on the uh, right side, you can see that in ICRC, we decided to say to the supplier, please stop using plastic bag and use cardboard. And you see the difference that when we uh, open the kitchen set, we don't have any uh, plastic bag more, uh, only few items still in plastic that we work on to uh, stop using. So you see the big difference uh, when we have the eco-design and not eco-design. Next slide. We have also seen some other good example. Um, we have seen few years ago that each tarpaulin distributed was packed into a plastic bag. So a tarpaulin made of plastic packed into a plastic bag. Uh, it was clearly a nonsense. Same for Jerican. So we decided to, to apply the same approach to work with manufacturers to tell them how can we keep the same level of quality, but uh, avoiding to have uh, too many plastic bags. And if we consider, it is linked also to the, the question we have seen at the beginning of the, as the meeting about um, um, Geneva covered by plastic. Here, if we consider only these three items, tarpaulin, Jerican, and a kitchen set will reach per year 53 tons of plastic bags. It means 14 million plastic. And if we compare to the football uh, field, it's around uh, 250 football field covered with plastic bags. So only for three items, only for ICRC, you see the big impact we can have. Next slide, please. Then the challenge is how to uh, ensure and to encourage the supplier to do it. So um, we have developed an, an approach called AQL, acceptance quality limit, when we try to, to define what is a critical measure, minor uh, non-conformity. And clearly in this uh, AQL, we uh, stipulate, we mention that we uh, don't want any uh, plastic bag and item not to be wrapped in a single use plastic. And if the supplier, they don't uh, respect this uh, point, they will be penalized. So we have a penalty related to the non-conformity and the, the supplier, they, they follow it uh, and they don't uh, uh, use any more plastic bag. And how to ensure that the supplier, they follow uh, the requirement and the AQL. In our logistics center, we have developed some uh, tools and with, with the team uh, trained on quality controller of quality controller, we uh, test also the item to be sure that there is no uh, plastic use, uh, that uh, also the quality is as per minimum requirement, targeting the right quality, not 
uh, over quality, but ensuring that we are uh, distributing to beneficiaries the right quality um, with the right price and also that we control the quality uh, of the item in our warehouses. Well, I think it is the last presentation, the last slide. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan, um, for your very interesting presentation. And, and just as a reminder to um, everyone here today, please put any questions you have um, for Stefan or the other speakers coming up into the chat box um, for our Q&A session um, shortly, in a little while. Um, next up, I'd like to invite uh, Georgina Stickles, uh, who's WFP's Environmental Sustainability Manager, um, who's going to speak um, about a few of the activities that WFP um, is leading or in joint pack initiative. Um, over to you, Georgie. Thanks, Mandy, and thanks very much, Stefan. It's so great to see some of these initiatives really starting to um, really starting to make a change in, in individual uh, project areas and with, with individual products. Uh, hello, everyone, and great to see so many familiar names and faces online here today, as well as so many new partners. It's just been so gratifying to see how this work has evolved over the um, over the, the, the six to 12, 18 months of the of the process and, and really see the head of steam that's starting to um, to build up. Um, want to, uh, as um, as I just congratulate ICRC on their initiative and we've seen similar successes um, a little, just a little while ago with the uh, shelter cluster on their shelter kits and eliminating plastic there too. Addressing these high visibility challenges is an essential part of changing our culture. I wanna talk a little bit now about some of the nuts and bolts and maybe slightly less sexy stuff um, or that is a, a necessary prerequisite for embedding change across the board um, because it's about how we get a good handle on our baseline data because it can, I'll give some examples in a minute, really throw up some surprises. So if we just, uh, WFP is engaged on, on three different areas in the, um, in the program. The first one uh, really picks up one of the key findings of the scoping study, which is that uh, you know, USAID and WFP and, and some others have, uh, have some great data about their own individual uh, packaging production data, um, but uh, we don't have a standardised approach for measuring packaging waste across the board. And of course, some of what USAID, USAID provides is distributed by WFP. So making sure that we don't have um, that we don't have double counting, we we don't have a coordinated way of doing that yet. And uh, so, as part of our contribution to to the JI and, and recognising that WFP will likely distribute a large chunk of the total um, total packaging waste, particularly for for food uh, food relief. Um, we're really looking forward then to working with USAID, IOM, UNHCR, um, Catholic Relief and uh, the ICRC on this waste baselining, establishing a common methodology, common language, set of definitions um, so that we can take this work forward. A lot of this work is looking at, um, <clears throat> pardon me, in the interest of data availability and reward for effort, we're very keen uh, to, to replicate uh, the work that WFP and, and USAID have done looking at top-down um, studies. WFP conducted footprinting, uh, footprinting studies in 2016 and 18 with a top-down approach to, to, uh, to packaging. So working out that if we've moved X tons of a food type that is uh, packaged in 25 kilo polypropylene bags, that means X bags in this country and Y bags in this country and Z bags in this country. Um, and so working, working on how we can help other um, uh, other partners to conduct a similar uh, a similar approach for themselves. We do also, that's not the only way to cut the cake, um, as it were, or to come up with a number. So working in alignment with uh, with those other partners uh, to uh, to define parameters and, and measures and make sure that we um, that we've uh, we've got a set of methodologies, probably more than one methodology, but making sure making sure that we've got a, a set of pref preferred methodologies um, that uh, that enable those figures to be. Um, compiled and compared without um, without overlaps. Um, I said before that sometimes when we pull all of the data together, it can really um, really surprise us. An example that I use quite a lot at WFP when we first started doing carbon footprinting, um, there'd been a, a huge uh, a huge investment made by WFP in a fleet management system for our truck fleets, and uh, you know because they were using millions of, of liters of fuel. Um, uh, according to the, the, the truck fleet, the global fleet team, um, and they were right, you know, 3 million litres a year of fuel, but nobody had ever added up. 
all of the fuel used by our light vehicles and it turned out it was twice as much and they didn't have a fleet management system. Um, they do now. Uh, but it, it can be really interesting to see the way that the numbers when we pull them together will uh, bring things bring things together. Similarly, um, the figures for uh, both for USAID and for WFP for uh, things like the multi-layer metallic sachets really never cease to amaze me. Our most recent um, inventory for WFP estimates that we distributed around a billion um, units of uh, a billion packets of, uh, of various foods in uh, in the metallic multi-layer sachets, which starts to become a really scary number when you consider that they are one of the hardest things to process in countries that do not have um, well-established waste processing facilities. In terms of process, progress to date in this area, it's really still been all about the um, the resourcing. We are very grateful for the support of, uh, of BHA in the form of a staffing resource. We're looking at finalising a TOR and identifying suitably qualified candidates to undertake this work. We are also in discussions with our colleagues in the logistics cluster, who are, of course, a key player in this space, have several years of work experience engaging um, the humanitarian logistics community in environmental and waste awareness. And, uh, and they have also secured some private donor funding the UPS Foundation to support baseline development work and we are really keen to work together to make sure that these two parcels of, of resource support are used in a way that produces well aligned and, and really complementary resource coordination here is just so important. Um, moving on to item 2.1.2 I just want to acknowledge the work of my colleague Carol Manso who I know is on the call today she's WFP's packaging specialist and the official part the, the kind of the lead part of her role is in fact to make sure that food distributed by WFP arrives in a safe and suitable condition uh, but we've really enjoyed working with her and colleagues who also tackle then what happens to that packaging once it's served its purpose and we find it in a place where it's very difficult to, um, to dispose of it safely. But Carol is spearheading WFP's work to explore options to perform life cycle assessments um, on our main types of packaging. So looking at bottles, polypropylene woven bags and the metallized multi-layer sachets that I just mentioned. The challenge is to find a tool that has a database, a life cycle analysis tool with a database that will be representative of the humanitarian supply chain and context. A lot of the data relates to um, existing data relates to uh, the use and disposal of these items in developed countries, not developing countries. Again, WFP has secured a private sector partner here to provide both seed funding and technical expertise into this work and conduct the first product uh, life cycle assessment. We recognise, <coughs> sorry, go ahead. I'm very sorry, Georgina. Uh, just yep. could you speak a little bit slower? The interpreters. Sorry, uh, of course. Uh, oh, at, at the end of, of the day, for them as well. yes. sorry, sorry. Understood. No, that's fine. Uh, we understand uh, here too that our priority is to engage with other agencies who are already taking action in this space. Uh, colleagues with the United uh, with the uh, humanitarian response depots have an established interest in life cycle assessment on packaging. A couple of years ago, they were looking at reusable insulation to help protect um, temperature sensitive nutrient enriched foods. We've had an initial meeting with UNEP's life cycle assessment team, and I managed to catch the shelter clusters fantastic piece on the collaboration with BRE earlier this week um, as part of Partnerships Week. And um, uh, as noted here on the slide, our full suite of partners then also includes IOM, UNHCR and, and Catholic Relief. Last but not least, another crucial part of the end of life puzzle is understanding what capacity already exists in various countries and locations. Um, as part of our own work at WFP on environmental management systems, we've identified solutions for recycling polypropylene food sacks in Kenya, turning bro broken plastic pallets into beverage crates and other second life items in Ethiopia. Um, we've been really keen, uh, really pleased to support partners in refugee camps in Kenya on livelihoods based projects that enable the collection, sorting and cleaning of waste ahead of shipping for recycling. Um, and again, want to acknowledge other work in this area that's beginning to, to take off. Uh, acknowledging the uh, the BHA mapping of waste management facilities in the Caribbean and uh, the LSE study that was presented earlier this week, um, contrasting uh, both an operation at the very much at the relief stage activities such as Yemen um, with a country far more advanced into the recovery stage, stage as Iran. In order to really do this work at scale, we are again very pleased to and very keen to explore um, potential for action with the logistics cluster, which WFP hosts. They have an existing capacity to integrate information about waste processing and recycling capacity into their uh, repository of logistics capacity assessments and to and, and bring excellent networks um, for conducting this research at scale through existing, uh, existing uh, relationships with academic partners. 
The work is still very much in a scoping and resourcing stage. If there are others who would like to be involved with this, um, then please uh, please do get in touch with Mandy and she'll uh, she'll connect us all together. We want to acknowledge uh, just today the presence of um, uh, Bruno van der Muellerbroek from the deputy head of the logistics cluster and the cluster's deep commitment to playing a role in this transformation um, and the work done to engage other partners, including IFRC, the Danish Refugee Council and Save the Children, um, who are keen to support progress, not only for their own agencies, uh, but also across the humanitarian logistics sector. Um, for me, I think one of the, the, the key elements uh, to, that we try that we're trying to bear in mind with our, our work across the the board here is um, one of the findings of the group URD uh, study funded by OCHA last year which found that environmentalists and humanitarians or logisticians um, we need to do more to learn to speak one another's language and um, I can see so many partners from from both sides of the shop here today and I think that that um, that mutual engagement is really um, is, is really beneficial and, and uh, seeing all of this work starting to come together is, is just when we stopped to add it all up there was there was a great deal of work that's already happy, happening. Um, the final then piece of the puzzle is to produce some map guidance on market-based opportunities for the secondary use of, of packaging. Um, I should probably leave it there I'm sure I'm out of time but uh, any questions on that uh, will be received with thanks. Cheers over. Thank you so much, Georgie, uh, for giving us an overview. And of course, we're so appreciative of WFP's leadership in this initiative and also in the in the space more broadly. Um, if you have questions for Georgie, please pop them into the chat. Um, before we take questions, I'd like to invite our, uh, our last uh, speaker from CRS, um, Sarah, who's the director, senior director of global supply chain management um, to take the floor. Um, Sarah will be speaking a bit about some of the activities that are contributing to the joint initiative. Uh, deliverables. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. And thanks to the previous uh, presenters um, for the great profiles. Um, today, I just wanted to touch on some of the work that we're doing on that end of life um, sector that Amanda was describing before and that um, Georgina was just describing. Um, and specifically around waste management. Uh, I want to profile some of the work we've been doing, some of the studies that we've been doing in partnership um, through, um, through two universities and um, with many people on this call. Next. So CRS is, um, is focusing on various avenues of climate change. Uh, we have our own internal climate action working group. Uh, we've been working on it for years, but we decided to have a, you know, to really formalize it in 2019. We're also looking at things like uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, the ability to track carbon emissions and then improve our activities therein. But today I'll focus, uh, like I mentioned, on the sustainability of humanitarian product packaging. In the past, we've done several studies, uh, again, in partnership and with the help of Villanova and Purdue University, um, up to uh, most recently looking at uh, end of life scoping study, uh, Greg mentioned before. Um, and through CRS, we looked at Madagascar, Ethiopia, and South Sudan activities. So what we focused on in those studies, in the Villanova and Purdue studies, was basically three categories. The packaging itself, exploring alternative packaging solutions, waste management, um, so looking at how uh, we could find alternatives to how we do or really don't um, manage waste uh, currently in our distributions. And then across the board, how can we engage the private sector and find um, shared values and incentives to uh, achieve alternatives in packaging and um, clean and environmentally friendly waste management solutions. Some of the key findings that came out of those studies were to um, introduce a type of recycling machine that would uh, help to convert the plastic into carbon powder 
and use it for things like batteries. Uh, Villanova and Purdue also both recommended uh, different biodegradable options for packaging. And, uh, but there are some challenges that come with that that were previously uh, mentioned, including uh, the cost of the shift and um, how to implement those shifts for, the, for, um, for donor funded grants that are already underway and therefore have committed funding. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, we also looked at how we could pro we could uh, convert to local supplier packaging and procurement and champion the shift to uh, per, uh, packaging alternatives uh, through local suppliers. Next. So what we want to do with the information that we've gotten is to adopt a pilot approach. Uh, because we've received the baseline information already, uh, we want to then go ahead and do a full mapping of waste management, uh, focusing on, um, on our Madagascar results. And um, through BHA uh, and through the joint, excuse me, through the Joint Sustainability Packaging Initiative, uh, we want to pilot the idea of introducing that pack, uh, that recycling machine that could help us improve, um, improve our impact um, on waste management, given the current packaging that we already have while we look for alternative packaging solutions. Um, and once we, once we get through that pilot, uh, of course, we will look at the constraints that we had, refine delivery solutions, and throughout uh, work with the private sector in our target countries uh, to uh, help us uh, make the best solution. So um, as the other presenters have mentioned, if you're working on something similar and you're interested in uh, joining the Joint Initiative for Sustainable Packaging, um, and the waste management priority, uh, we really love to hear from you and we'd love for you to join the conversation. So, uh, so with that, I will hand it back uh, to Amanda and uh, look forward to your questions. Right, I'm actually gonna intercept that. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks to all the presenters. I have some uh, waste management going on outside my window as always happens during these calls. Um, so apologies for the any noise you hear in the background. Um, and so yeah, now we're just going into the question and answer. Um, and I think there have been some great ones in the chat. So if it's okay for uh, with everybody, I think we'll um, I'll just read some of those out and call on some of the folks to clarify their questions. Um, and I think we'll we'll start with Marco. Um, had a couple of good questions here, and one of them was quite long. So um, if it's okay, Marco, do you just want to come off mute? Um, oh, I hope it's possible to do that actually. Anybody can tell me if that's not going to be possible. Uh, let me know. But it'd be great just to hear from Marco Caniato um, and uh, questions that he had. I think Marco should be able to unmute himself. But no, uh, can you hear me? Ah, yes, yeah, great. Sorry, we can. Thank you, Marco. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for this presentation. It's very interesting and very interesting initiatives. Um, actually, the, the question, uh, the first one is uh, regarding uh, uh, the scale. I mean, it's a very complex issue and uh, these initiatives are very welcome, very important, but can be obviously proposed only by large organizations and mainly for international uh, procurement, large procurement while at the local level uh, and for small organization, small middle-sized organization, it's much more difficult. So how do you think it's possible to involve them? And also how it's possible to link humanitarian organization with the development organization, but also the private sector in general, uh, because at the end of the day, that should be coordinated also with the Public, uh, public utilities and uh, other actors, uh, especially in those countries where waste management, for example, is disrupted or uh, simply the level is, is very low. Over. Uh, 
Thanks. I'm happy to respond to that. It's Georgina here. Great. Um, I, I, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I wanted to uh, to just pick up uh, because uh, they have talked about this issue of it, it happening at scale, and you know, and it's all very well if if you're WFP. Um, I just wanted to emphasise that in fact a lot of the solutions that we have been finding in the field. Um, have been with local companies rather than big international companies. And some of those solutions have been put together then with implementation funding uh, from, from donor governments um, or that are seeking to foster green economy in developing countries, green economy businesses. Um, but uh, the company that's taking uh, more than 6 million polypropylene bags for us now in Kenya and we're shipping them in from all over the country is a local business in Nairobi. And similarly, it was a local company in, um, in Ethiopia that's taking our broken plastic pallets, putting them into a very, relatively small plastics injection molding machine once the, the pallets have been um, pelletized, broken down into tiny pieces. And, uh, and then it, injecting them back into things like beverage crates and other usable items. Some of these substances can be recycled over and over. And so, and somebody had picked up through that end of life is all very well, but shouldn't we be looking at what we use? And you're exactly right. Um, because uh, we, and one of the things that WP is looking at doing is uh, finding the places where we might be able to substitute polypropylene, which is one type of plastic um, that degrades a bit over time, a little bit like when you recycle paper. Um, it's not always quite as good the next time you, you recycle it uh, with something like, I think it's polyethylene, um, that can be recycled with no loss of quality over and over, a bit more like glass. So it's about looking at um, the substances that we produce that will enable us to get the food or the, the products to, um, uh, to a destination in a condition that means the underlying item can still provide relief and then making sure that we have a valid use. We are, we're either eliminating um, eliminating plastic and substituting it with something like paper, which might be more easy, easy to dispose of, um, or taking a plastic and turning it into something durable. We have also seen, for example, projects where um, plastics can be used in road construction or, um, or uh, construction bricks. So other lasting applications, which mean that plastic isn't becoming a waste, it's becoming a resource in the development and, and we call this a, a, the green economy. Um, it needs to happen at, at scale at the moment. What we've got is a bunch of really exciting pilots and, uh, and looking at how we build that up is of course, uh, part of the, uh, the objective of, uh, of the, the partners who are all here today, over. Um, uh, can I just complement one thing? Because I think what Georgina has explained is uh, is very important. But also, I think the um, the joint initiative will also create some clear guidelines for the for the local purchases in the field who will actually be enabled to do this small step in the field. So when they buy something, then they will not have the plastic bag. So which is simple because you have anything you buy you buy it in a plastic bag i think uh, what uh, what um, stefan showed was quite simple you know a tarpaulin with a plastic bag simple things like that but th that we have to bring the awareness to our own people and i think this joint initiative will also create that will help us to create that into our own organizations uh, so i just wanted to to say that because i think it's a way to really you know to go to the field level if, and if i could also jump in um talking the last part of the question was around private sector engagement and I saw there was another question in the chat about um, how we are incorporating that into various projects or existing projects and um, I really think the emphasis has to be on uh, response and resilience you know creating that demand and that incentive for local s suppliers and um, making sure that like I mentioned before there's um, shared incentive to make this to make this work um, and that can be I don't want to say easily but it is an important thing to incorporate in any existing program um, and with that I'll hand it back to Greg excellent thank you all so much um, yeah does anybody else wanted to want to comment on any of that I think that, that did capture quite a few of the questions just about one of the local actors and localization um, which I think we all agree it's really important. And in this 
COVID environment um, that we've been doing work more in the headquarters and not being able to travel and have made a good amount of progress, but um, yeah, it's time to get down to the field. Um, I think there's, there's one other question that I think just we have a couple minutes like to move on to, um, and this one's actually uh, Erica, do you want to come off mute if you can and ask that one um, of Sarah and of, of our other colleagues as well, that are really connecting the uh, humanitarian to, to development kinds of activities. With many thanks, uh, Greg. And I, I believe uh, with the great thanks to CRS, I believe um, you began to respond to it, but I don't know if CRS would like um, to provide some additional information, really just thinking about uh, more broadly how we can better integrate this work into the ongoing support, for example, that USAID has. And again, forgive me, I'm Erica Closeri. I'm with USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance as a Bureau Environmental Officer. And my apologies for joining this excellent work late, but we were in good hands. Um, but yeah, so I don't know, CRS or, or frankly, SAVE as well, with Sue, with your work, I'd be quite keen to better understand how it is that you're incorporating this type of environmental sustainability, packaging, et cetera, into your ongoing work that's supported by USAID, either vis-a-vis -vis your response work or your ongoing uh, multi-year uh, resilience uh, programming. Over. Yeah, I'll, uh, thanks. I'll answer briefly because I know we're getting close to time and so I can leave some space for um, SAVE to answer as well. Um, so I'll give the example of our work in Madagascar. Uh, we are looking, one of the reasons we wanted to focus um, on our Madagascar country program is because it's already um, a, a country program where we have ongoing operations uh, with USAID and other donors. And so we thought it behooved us to see how we could layer in a conversation about waste management packaging and private sector engagement in, a, in ongoing operations that are already dealing with the impact of waste in our distributions. And um, in addition to that, uh, you know, I had mentioned the private sector, um, there are identified waste management providers in Madagascar. And um, we, we believe that uh, it's through work with them that we can provide evidence that can impact um, in a in a responsive way, the programming we already have in Madagascar, and then um, and well, I'll I'll leave it at that and and uh, hand it over to Save the Children. So uh, thanks, Sarah. So um, Save is focused initially on the source of the problem. So talking to our suppliers so that we're not sending the packaging having to deal with the waste we're trying to focus on the source of the problem so our core relief contracts our global contracts at the minute all have to meet a certain um sustainability criteria and and that can be anything from not using things like stainless steel and aluminium but um, our packaging side we insisted it all had to be cardboard it all had to be biodegradable or they had to find a solution we won't accept single-use plastics in any way shape or form um, we, we paid the extra money in the sense of when we deployed, when we send our tarpaulins out, we uh, ask HRD to, to package them in a tarpaulin and not in plastic wrap. Mm. Uh, we know that costs us more, but it's the right thing to do. And our Eastern Southern Africa programs, we're talking the Kenny Horn of Africa area, we've had some really good experiences at even operational level. So none of our suppliers are allowed to produce food and polystyrene products or plastic bags. We've been very clear about that. So they either have to come in, say cardboard or wax line, or there has to be, you know, tin mugs, don't care what it is, but they absolutely can't produce um, non-biodegradable waste. So we're trying to focus on that. And, and I think the point about localization is key is, and I would also say, you know, we, we're looking at, for, Safe is looking for a supply chain point, but for many times the supply chain is driven by the programs. So we're also trying to get the program mentality to change that, when they order things, <laughs> can they please think about what they're ordering? Uh, you don't need a plastic covered notebook because you can have a cardboard covered notebook. So we're trying to look at that and address the start of the problem rather than the waste management of the problem. Thank you. 
Absolutely fascinating. Many thanks um, again for, for SAVE and CRS's leadership in, in this space. Um, we definitely love vis-a-vis uh, -vis this work and others to kind of un unpack that, uh, so to speak, uh, pun intended, I suppose, um, unpack that um, a little bit further um, with, with you all and, and see if we can't get some more direct engagement with uh, with our USAID leadership, et cetera, in this kind of space in, in, in Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Many, many thanks uh, to you both. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you who asked questions um, and to our presenters. Um, I will just wrap us up for today because I know we're at time. Um, if we could have the next uh, slide, please. So how can you get involved? Um, as I mentioned before, we are a joint initiative. Um, it's all about our, our members and joint participation. The more we are together, we are stronger. So please do get involved. Um, you can register your interest with us via the Google form. Uh, the link was in the chat. I'm sure someone can just pop it back in there again today. Um, if there are any particular activities or working groups um, that you have um, heard about today that you would like to be part of, please do let us know. Um, we are also looking to collectively explore additional funding opportunities as well. So that's something that we can work on together. Um, please join our events, our mailing list and spread the word. I know that um, our communications lead, Gabriella, has popped the link to our newsletter and um, sign up for the mailing list in the chat as well. Um, yeah, and please do help us spread uh, the word um, and get involved. Um, on the next slide, you have all of our contacts, uh, everyone who was speaking today, um, so that you can stay in touch. Um, and I'll just wrap up by saying thank you so much to you all for joining us today. Thank you to all our presenters. Uh, a big thank you to Bruno and Andre and other uh, logistics cluster colleagues uh, for hosting this meeting. Um, please do stay in touch and enjoy the rest of the HMPW and of course have a wonderful weekend. Thank you all. Thanks so much for a really uh, relevant, fascinating and topical briefing to round off the last of the marketplace sessions. Um, really, really interested to hear such a great collaboration. So thank you very much for that one. And I should think everybody's busily logging off after all, all the screen time this week, but just to finally say thanks so much to everybody who's presented in these marketplace sessions. It's really been fantastic to see the range of initiatives across the, the spectrum of humanitarian logistics. And thanks, of course, to everybody who participated in the great exchanges and, and questions that came in and comments. So thanks very much to everybody for making the marketplace a really a really great uh, couple of days and looking forward to seeing you next time